<laughs> Never mind. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Today's Tuesday, July 2nd, and this is um, Recite Poetry. First Tuesday of every month. i um, been going for three and a half years, um, which is just awesome. Thank you, Macy from WCTV8 to come and film this thing for us and put it up on your website so everyone who wasn't here can see what they missed. Um, and we can relive it over and over and over again. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> like a time zone. <laughs> yeah. Twilight it, zone. It could be heaven or hell, Don't depending on what happens. Yeah. Um, so there's one thing that Bob reminded me to mention, which I would have thought of like at the end of the evening. Um, there's at the end of this month is Bookstock. I don't know if everyone knows that, but Bookstock is the last weekend of July every year. This will be the 11th annual, and it's a celebration of books and authors. And so over 40 authors come to town. At the top of the hour in like four or five different locations around town, there's different authors speaking, and all of that's free. There's this big schedule of who's speaking where, when, and you can go to all of that stuff, and that's free. And there's a huge book sale on the green. Um, mammoth, like the one we have here at the library, but on steroids, um, and it's just wonderful. And it's a really fun weekend. It's the second busiest weekend of the year in Woodstock. Actually, it's a it's fun. So come early to get a parking spot if you're not local. Um, and a lot of the poetry, all of the poetry, most of the poetry, the UU is full of poetry <laughs> that weekend. Um, all of the events in the at the UU at the North Chapel are poetry events. So you know this crowd might want to hang out there for a lot of it. Um, and in the evenings, there's different things um, going on different nights. And the Thursday night, the night before the official start of Bookstock, at Artistry, there is going to be an evening of poetry and dance honoring Mary Oliver, who died earlier this year, who was one of the most famous American poets of modern times, um, probably the best-selling American poet of modern times, I think. Um, and so Bob Burchess and I are both going to be readers in that thing, and Peg Brightman's dance troupe is going to be doing dance, and it's going to be just this conglomeration of things honoring Mary Oliver. Um, go ahead, Bob. It's fine. I'm talking about you. So, you know. <laughs> um, and that will be Thursday night, July 25th at Artistry at 7 p.m. or something like that. Um, and that, that's going to be fun, and then that sort of kicks off the Hopefully book stock it weekend. It will be publicized. Peg Brightman's very good about doing that kind of thing, and Bookstock is in general. So, um, yeah, so that'll be good. And I, um, I'm i going to read some poetry. Hang on, I'm sorry. This is my fan, but it's also information about the poet I'm going to read poems of tonight. So, Joy Harjo is the new United States Poet Laureate. And she's the first Native American US Poet Laureate. And um, so I went on to poets.org and I found some of her poetry and I picked out some really, some poems I really like. And I thought I would read some of those um, to get us started this evening. The first one, I think, um, it, it's, to me, I feel, I, I like this gathering that we have, this repeated gathering where we sort of come together and talk about things that we're wrestling with, whether we've written our own poems or whether it's someone else's poems, they're all things that are really deeply important. Um, and that's along the lines of what this first poem is. It's called, Perhaps the World Ends Here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it, we make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves and as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. 
Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are all laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. This poem is called Remember. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of the universe. Remember you are all people, and all people are you. Remember you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is, that life is. Remember. And one last one um, for this half called Eagle Poem. Eagle? Eagle, like eagle. Okay. I don't know whether it's E-G-L or E-A-G-L-E. E-A-G-L-E, yeah. Um, eagle Poem. To pray you open your whole self to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. And know there is more that you can't see, can't hear, can't know except in moments steadily growing and in languages that aren't always sound but other circles of motion. Like Eagle that Sunday morning over Salt River, circled in blue sky, in wind, swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you, see ourselves, and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in, knowing we are made of all this, and breathe, knowing we are truly blessed because we were born, and die soon within a true circle of motion, like eagle rounding out the morning inside us. We pray that it will be done in beauty, in beauty. So that's Joy Harjo, our new poet laureate. Yay! Well, that's how our last name is pronounced. J is pronounced. Uh, H A R J O. I am guessing on how it's pronounced. Oh. I haven't found a phonetical, phonetic version of it yet. So that's just my guess. Yeah, okay. But H A R J O. Um, alrighty. So we have seven um, presenters this evening, other than me. Um, how about we start with Don Wang, oh. who is new to this group? Welcome, Don. We're going to talk about Andre Nash tonight. You remember him. <laughs> Had a lot of fun with the English language. And uh, when my four children were growing up, they were required to learn some Ogden Nash. <clears throat> Excuse me. So tonight, we're going to start with a poem that I used to read to them on March 21st of each year. It's about Jarvis Gravel. And here's how it goes. <clears throat> Hey Don, before you begin, the children didn't suffer from too much Ogden Nash. 
I'll wait till this gentleman sits down. I'm sorry very much. No, no problem. That's fine. Better that than not showing up at all, right? Let's get it close. I will read you this poem about Jarvis Gravel. I will recite it. I'm not reading. It's all a cappella. I will read you this, recite this poem about Jarvis Gravel. And then I have a bunch of short ones all about animals. So here we go. <clears throat> there was once a man named Jarvis Gravel, who was just a man named Jarvis Gravel, except for one thing. He hated spring. And this was because once a communist had said, come down to Union Square, it's May Day. And Jarvis went, thinking he had said, come down to Union Square, it's payday. <laughs> and from then on, anything at all vernal was to him strictly infernal. And when the first crocus would poke its head up, he'd get a shovel and dig the entire bed up. And he bought a horse and galloped back and forth, tipping off the worms when the first robin started north. <laughs> to love the way of a man with a maid and the moonlight is something he never learnt. And he spent a lot of beautiful, balmy evenings moving fresh paint signs from park benches that were freshly painted to ones that weren't. <laughs> when he finally did marry a girl who made his pulses quicken, it was only because her name was Gail Winterbottom. <laughs> and she was no spring chicken. <laughs> and one day, during the worm warning season, he came home hungry after a hard day in the syrup, in the stirrup, and she served him waffles, but he objected to the maypole syrup. So she shot him through the heart, but his last words were ecstatic. He said, thank you, honey. It was thoughtful of you to use the automatic. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about some animals. <laughs> Behold the hippopotamus. We laugh at how he looks at us, and yet in moments dank and grim, I wonder how we look to him. Peace, peace, thou hippopotamus. We really look all right to us, as you no doubt delight the eye of other hippopotami. <laughs> The rhino is a homely beast, for human eyes he is no feast. Farewell, farewell, you old rhinoceros. I'll stare at something less preposterous. <laughs> the kangaroo can jump incredible. He has to jump because he's edible. <laughs> I would not eat a kangaroo, but many fine Australians do. Those with cookbooks, as well as boomerangs, prefer him in case tasty kangaroo meringues. <laughs> Myself, I rather like the bat. It's not a mouse, it's not a rat. It has no feathers, yet has wings. It's quite inaudible when it sings. It zigzags through the evening air and never lands in ladies' hair a fact to which men spend their lives attempting to convince their wives. <laughs> the panther is like a leopard, except it hasn't been peppered. Should you behold a panther crouch, prepare to say, ouch. Better yet, if called by the panther, don't answer. <laughs> Oh, weep for Mr. and Mrs. Brian, for he was eaten by a lion, following which the lion's lioness up and swallowed Brian's Brianus. I give you now Professor Twist, a conscientious scientist. Trustees exclaimed he never bungles and sent him off to distant jungles. Camped by the tropic riverside, one day he missed his loving bride. She had, the guide informed him later, been eaten by an alligator. Professor Twist could not but smile. You mean he said a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> a 
The ant has made himself illustrious through constant industry industrious. So what? Would you be calm and placid if you were filled with formic acid? And finally, some primal termite knocked on wood and tasted it and found it good. And that is why your cousin May fell through the parlor floor today. <laughs> And did everyone get a look at Don's shirt? Yeah. <laughs> Nietzsche. I'm sorry? Your shirt is wonderful. I love your shirt. Oh, oh thank you. Nietzsche is peachy. Nietzsche is peachy. Nietzsche is peachy. Absolutely. All righty. Um, okay, so let's see. Next, Anne Chefmaster, would you like to go next? Okay. Okay. Awesome. What happened to the air conditioning? <laughs> is the whole library out or just um, this one? Uh, the downstairs children's section is the only air conditioning that works. Uh, the whole HVAC system is going to be replaced at oh, the end so of the summer um, because we really want to have heat in the winter. <laughs> and it's an either, know, it, either or. It, well, it's, um, it, anyway. so next summer there will be good air conditioning. But they're still raising money, so if you want to help it along, send it uh, 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 <laughs> Let's hope we're all here. And <laughs> I'm going to read two tonight. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Biopsy. Um, the doctor is so young, my heart aches for love. It's a spiteful hammer without a nail to pound. As I lie on the table, he hands me a mirror, which I reject. I don't like to watch the needle pierce my skin, and I don't want to know the when. Am I hurting you, he says, as the lidocaine goes in. The handsome prince leans over my face for a kiss. He cradles the questionable lesion with touch, and I'm left behind in a world without sense. There will be a scar regardless. Vaseline and a Band-Aid next. He wishes all of his patients were like me. Didn't even flinch. Of course, he shouldn't say this, but it's hard enough for him without having to manage someone else's pain. Whether now or later, I will relinquish tenure on earth. I will move slowly toward the finish of all of this. But it's the in-between, the silence in the scream. It's the in-between that hurts. Um, this poem is called Besiege. Um, besiege me with self-love before I am lost in old age. To myself I am whole, but to the world I am broken into parts. In the grocery store I am harassed. I believe in politeness, but man this and man that is too much. I can reach above my head for the rigatoni. I can bend down for the toilet paper in the bottom of the cart. For a woman of a certain age, my male gynecologist says, you look great. <laughs> Just exactly what is he looking at? My vagina or my face? And when did great become a synonym for dry? And is a raisin less edible than a grape? To myself, by myself, I stand up straight. There is no fumbling, forgetting, slow crawl into a grief that I had not imagined. A hard set grief of forced surrender to a world forgetful that age is a benediction and not a disgrace. Thank you very much. Um, alrighty. Oh, so one other thing. We have our book here that is here every month. Um, it'd be great, whoever, if we'd love to have everybody sign it. Um, whether you read or not, put notes if you want, whose poetry you read or whatever, just anything you want. It's just for posterity, just we have a little um, remembrance of what we do here. Um, let's see, Peter, 
Fox, would you like to go next? I'll go next. All righty, Peter Fox Smith, everybody. I had a professor in graduate school that I liked very much. He was a wonderful teacher. He was fluent in 12 languages, which greatly inspired in me a love for languages. I wish I was better at them than I am. But tonight I'm going to read some versions of poems in another language that I have put into English. And the other reason I liked that professor so much, he liked my poems. <laughs> and how he ever found them in an obscure, tiny, unbeknown journal of a college in Boston, Massachusetts is beyond me. But he said on one occasion, I really like your poetry. Uh, he was a wonderful teacher, an amazing linguist, and I still think with great admiration of him. I think I've said before that I don't translate poems. I really doubt that you can. You can translate the words, but not the rhyme and the meter. That's basically impossible. So I call what I do versions. And my first one is a version of a poem by Quattro Tasso, the great Italian poet of the Renaissance period. And it's quite short and entitled, in my version, The Woods and rivers are silent. Tacchiano e boschi e i fiumi is the poem. The woods and rivers are silent, and the sea flat without waves. The cavern winds rest peacefully, and in the dark night, the white moon spreads a lofty silence and we conceal love's sweetness. Love neither speaks nor breathes. Silent kisses and silent my sighing. I love Tasso's poetry. <laughs> the next one, Le Vin Perdu, it's a French poem by Paul Valéry, and I call it in my version, The Lost Wine, which actually is an exact translation of Le Vin Perdu. One day into the ocean, but I don't know in what place, I threw as an offering to nothingness a little precious wine. Who wanted your loss, O oh liquor? Perhaps I did obey the soothsayer. Perhaps the anxiety of my heart, thinking of blood pouring wine. The pure sea resumed its usual transparency after a rosy tint. The wind lost the inebriated waves. Leaping in the bitter air, I saw the most profound figures. I don't know how your, your German is, so when you hear the phrase, Und Deutschland Dichter, that is a German poet, Und Deutschland Dichter. 
So I have for you first a heroic riddle. See if you can answer the riddle. Who wandered China by river, by road, singing songs while plucking strings for tunes? Until one night he got so drunk he drowned when he slipped, trying to embrace the moon. Who wandered Germany to Ohio, his heart so sore with melancholia, his brain eventually left its room, and he died in a cell, swatting flies with a broom. So daily one was drunk in jars of wines, and one's spleen sick with unrequited loves, but both put lives in memorable lines sung from devils below to gods above. Anybody want to try to answer the riddles who the two poets are? Who? Immortal Chinese poet Li Po. Und Deutschland Dichter Nicholas Leno. So I've taken a poem of Li Po's and a poem of Leno's and call these heroic voices in song. Wine by Li Po, an improvisation in American English. Never refuse wine. It makes us smile while spring breezes scatter blossoms of peach and plum nearby. When orioles sing in jade trees or moonlight dips into golden jars of wine. Yesterday our youth bloomed. Today our hairs are white. Brambles consume temple grounds and dear Rome garden ruins. Always it has been like this, all turning to yellow dust. If you don't drink wine, past and present mean nothing. Second song, Coming and Going by Nicholas Leno a version in American English. Whenever she came, she was more lovely than the first green after winter. And when she spoke, she touched my heart more sweetly than the first song of spring. But when her hand waved farewell, the final dream of youth fled from me. And I have one more that I've been working on this week. So this one is still, and uh, Yash, you said last week it was courageous of me to read things that are new. This is so new that it's still in almost unreadable penciled script. The title in English is Vanity, Vanity of Vanities. The title, as you probably know, is the first line of Ecclesiastes. And the poem that follows is a parody of a religious poem and a say you're getting a version in American English of this parody that is a poem by Johann van Goethe. I set my mind on nothing. Hooray! Everything in the world is good to me. Hooray! Whomever will be my friend clinks glasses, toasts with me, 
and drinks the wine to its dregs. I set my mind on money and virtue. Hurrah! But therefore lost all joy and courage. Whoa! The coin rolled here and there, and as I snatched at it in one place, off it rolled to another. So I set my mind on women. Hurrah! But accordingly, much trouble came to me. The deceitful one sought herself another man. The faithful one was boring, and the best one was not for sale. I set my mind on travel and a trip, hurrah, and left behind customs of my fatherland, whoa, and did not feel right anywhere. The food was peculiar, the bed was bad, and nobody could understand me. So I set my mind on glory and pride, hurrah, but saw others who had so much more. Whoa, oh, how prominent I made myself and saw the people envy me, yet I did nothing right. So I set my mind on fighting and war. Ha! We accomplished many victories. Hooray! We moved into the enemy's country where friends should not be so much better. And I lost a leg. Now I have set my mind on nothing. Hurrah! And the entire world has heard of me. Hurrah! To an end comes all song and feasting. So now I drink to the dregs all the wine. The last drop must go. So that was my... Thank you. My fun this week of working with some other languages. <laughs> was really fun. So you were the translator of all of those? From German and Chinese and uh, the French? The Chinese and was not a translation. That was oh. an, it had to be an imitation. I don't read Chinese. Oh, okay. uh, the French, the German, the Italian, I did. Yes. Okay, awesome. That's wonderful. Um, alrighty, so let's see. We'll... Um, We'll have one more, Corey, would you like to go next? And then after that, we'll have an intermission, at which time, if you'd like to sign the book, you're welcome to. And there's refreshments. Did all of that come from you, Josh? Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, um, yeah, okay. Thanks. The host of the Red And uh, lots of others. <laughs> and Fatima, well. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. The first one I'm going to read is called um, Reading a Coworker's Obituary. She answered the phone for six months or so before being asked to leave. She answered the phone breathlessly, always breathlessly, and tried to direct calls, tried to take messages, left patients on hold far too long and unknowingly hung up on others. She left messages on your desk and the caller's name would be spelled wrong or the, number, or the phone number would be missing a digit or the piece of paper would have coke stains on it. Spoke of her dog, her dog that slept in bed with her, snarled at the maintenance man. She died in her apartment and you know her dog nudged her, howled at the door, and she would have dutifully responded 
if only she could. Um, and this one is called Early Springtime. Early springtime and each new leaf on the bush outside the window is more perfect than the next. Diminutive and round, unblemished and burgeoning, like our daughter's toes at the water's edge. Um, and I thought I would read um, three or four haiku for something different. I write a lot of these because if you don't have time, writing three lines is you know, not impossible. <laughs> so this is the first one. Pieces of chalk in a desk drawer, slate colored sky. Uh, this second one has a, does have a title, Wild Turkeys. Wild turkeys pass through the graveyard, stepping carefully, heads held low. The third, cardinal preaches to a congregation of nodding ferns. And the last, x-ray scheduled cloud shadows on the mountain. Thank you, Corey. OK, intermission. Let's see. It's. 621. So, we'll so I have glasses to wear, which will help because I have a few more poems by the new um, United States Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo. I believe it's Harjo. It's H-A-R-J-O. I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm guessing. Um, she's the first Native American Poet Laureate, which is kind of fun. Um, and so I read a few of her poems at the beginning of this evening, and I have a few more. And then we have three more poets. It'll be Bob, then Richard, then Yash, and then we'll go home. Okay. This poem is called Speaking Tree, and at the beginning there's a um, quote, and there's a name for a, a one-liner quote at the beginning of a poem, someone else's. I had a beautiful dream I was dancing with the tree by Sandra Cisneros. Some things on this earth are unspeakable. Genealogy of the broken. A shy wind threading leaves after a massacre. Or the smell of coffee and no one there. Some humans say trees are not sentient beings, but they do not understand poetry. Nor can they hear the singing of trees when they are fed by wind or water music, or hear their cries of anguish when they are broken and bereft. Now I am a woman longing to be a tree planted in a moist, dark earth between sunrise and sunset. I cannot walk through all realms. I carry a yearning I cannot bear alone in the dark. What shall I do with all this heartache? The deepest rooted dream of a tree is to walk, even just a little ways, from the place next to the doorway, to the edge of the river of life, and drink. I have heard trees talking long after the sun has gone down. Imagine what it would be like to dance close together in this land of water and knowledge, to drink deep what is undrinkable. This poem is called, Once the World Was Perfect. Once the world was perfect, and we were happy in that world. Then we took it for granted. Discontent began a small rumble in the earthly mind. Then doubt pushed through with its spiked head and once doubt ruptured the web, all manner of demon thoughts jumped through. We destroyed the world we had been given for inspiration for life. Each stone of jealousy, each stone of fear, greed, envy, and hatred put out the light. No one was without a stone in his, in his or her hand. There we were, right back where we had started. We were bumping into each other in the dark. And now we had no place to live, 
since we didn't know how to live with each other. Then, one of the stumbling ones took pity on another and shared a blanket. A spark of kindness made a light. The light made an opening in the darkness. Everyone worked together to make a ladder. And Wind Clan person climbed out first into the next world. And then the other clans, the children of those clans, their children, and their children, all the way through time to now, into this morning light to you. And this last poem is called, This Morning I Pray for My Enemies. And whom do I call my enemy? An enemy must be worthy of engagement. I turn in the direction of the sun and keep walking. It's the heart that asks the question, not my furious mind. The heart is the smaller cousin of the sun. It sees and knows everything. It hears the gnashing even as it hears the blessing. The door to the mind should only open from the heart. An enemy who gets in risks the danger of becoming a friend. That's her. Our new poet laureate. She's awesome. Okay, so now, Bob Burgess. All righty. For what? Whatever you have. <laughs> You're about to tackle me or whatever. I'll do my best. Isn't she fun? Yeah. I brought my staff. Oh. <laughs> Don't mess with me or Peter's I brought my staff that comfort me. I brought my staff that comfort She just stuck her tongue out at me. And this is my better half. She knows what's coming. There are so many responses to that, but I'm not sure of the political correctness. Let's just move on. Let's just move on. Or I've barely gotten started, I see. Ogden, you're not laughing. That's scaring me. Still not Stop. laughing. Okay, let me hang myself. Okay, it's going to be a tough audience. All right. Well, I too, like um, Corey, didn't have all the time I wanted to prepare seamless offerings. <coughs> and so we're going to start with some similar little Zen offerings, tidbits to Start me fun and games contributions for the night versus probably ending up in Bleak House again, <laughs> as will happen to all of us, no matter how much you all protest that smelling the flowers is better than all the rest. So these are just some poetry and revelations of enlightenment. Uh, profound aha moments, as it were. When I was young and naive, I wanted to be a Superman. Now I'm old and wise. Nothing's changed. <laughs> It seems I walk endlessly in the shadow of me own life, ghost in me own house, trying to find out whoever the hell I really am. Humility takes some getting used to. Ah. Vices does. And then, oh, saved by the bell. So humility takes some getting used to, 
But then when you turn a ripe old age, it does become a daily affair. (laughs) So let's move on to one of my old hippie (coughs) beatnik favorites. Poet laureate of the California slums, L.A., San Francisco, with a little politically incorrect ditty by Charlie Bukowski. (laughs) Nevertheless, exuding a certain bestial charm, And its title, unsurprisingly, is simply sex. So I'm driving down Wilton Avenue, right? When this girl of about 15, dressed in tight blue jeans, that grip her behind like two hands, steps out in front of my car. I stop to let her cross the street, and as I watch her contours waving, she looks directly through my windshield at me with those purple eyes, and then, you've seen this before, blows out of her mouth the largest pink globe of bubble gum I have ever seen. (laughs) Well, I'm just listening to Beethoven on the car radio. (laughs) She enters a small grocery store and is gone. What am I left with? Ludwig. <sighs> okay, so moving right along, here's a here's a a little W. H. Auden for smooth contrast. Sometimes we need a break from all the whatever it is. So looking up at the stars, I know quite well that for all they care, I can go to hell. (laughs) But on earth, indifference is the least that we have to dread from man or beast. How should we like it? Were stars to burn with a passion for us, we could not return. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Admirer as I think I am of stars that do not give a damn, I cannot now I see them say, I missed one terribly all day. Were all stars to disappear or die, I should learn to look at an empty sky and feel its total dark, sublime, though this might take me a little time. Let's have a little something about feelings by Mr. E. E. Since feeling is first, who pays any attention to the syntax of things will never wholly kiss you. Holy to be a fool while spring is in the world, my blood approves. And kisses are a better fate than wisdom, lady, I swear by all the flowers. So don't cry 
The best gesture of my brain is less than your eyelids flutter, which says we are for each other. Then laugh, leaning back on my arms, for life is not a paragraph, and death, I think, is no parenthesis. So, let's end with this little ditty. Life is slipping away through my fingers, slowly, imperceptibly, though I clutch it to me closely, thoughtfully, every step of the way, piece by piece, little by little, it is breaking up despite all efforts to keep it together, examining every moment, living in the present, and all the rest. Letting go is so very hard to do. Thanks for listening. five times this week where the theme of letting go is so very hard to do has come up in conversation with different people facing different things. It's true. Let's see, Richard Esty, would you like to be next? Good. How are we doing on time, okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, well maybe I'll I have two Robert Frost poems, but maybe I'll begin with um, a new little poem by Emily Dickinson that I memorized in the last few weeks. Um, Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, but never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Um, I'm doing two Robert Frost poems. One, the first one is from his actually first collection, published collection, published in 1913, The Tuft of Flowers. And I like this because I, um, it, is, it, it talks about using a scythe. And when I was 60 years younger, I used a scythe. Um, and I can sort of picture what he's doing. Okay. I went to turn the grass once after one who had mowed it in the dew before the sun. The dew was gone that made his blade so keen before I came to view the level scene. I looked for him behind an aisle of trees. I listened for his whetstone on the breeze. But he had gone his way, the grass all mown, and I must be as he had been alone. As all must be, I said within my heart, whether they work together or apart. As I said it, swift there passed me by, I noiseless wing, a bewildered butterfly, seeking with memories grown dim or night, some resting flower of yesterday's delight. And once I marked his flight go round and round, as where some flower lay withering on the ground, and then he flew as far as I could see. And then, on tremulous wing, came back to me. I thought of questions that have no reply and would have turned to toss the grass to dry. But he turned first and led my eye to look. 
at a tall tuft of flowers beside a brook. A leaping tongue of bloom the scythe had spared. Beside a reedy brook the scythe had bared. The mower in the dew had loved them thus, by leaving them to flourish, not for us, nor to draw one thought of ours to him, but from sheer morning gladness at the brim. The butterfly and I had lit upon, nevertheless, a message from the dawn that made the wakening birds, that made me hear the wakening birds around and hear his long sigh whispering to the ground and feel a spirit kindred to my own so that henceforth I work no more alone. But glad with him, I work as with his aid and weary at noon, sought with him the shade, and dreaming as it were, held brotherly speech with one whose thought I had not hoped to reach. Men work together, I told him from the heart, whether they work together or apart. And then, in, um, in the last volume of published poetry, you know, separate volumes, in 1962, uh, so 49 years later, there's another Frost poem. And I brought my little cheat sheet because I've only been working on this for a few weeks. And there is one section in the center I have trouble with. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, I don't really trust myself that I really know it, but I may have not I can glance down if I need to. And this is another um, you know, seasonal poem, and it's the objection to being stepped on. At the end of the row, I stepped on the toe of an unemployed hoe. It rose in offense and struck me a blow in the seat of my sense. It wasn't to blame, but I called it a name. And I must say that it dealt me a blow that I felt like malice prepense. You may call me a fool, but was there a rule the weapon should be turned into a tool? And what do we see? The first tool I step on turned into a weapon. Thanks, Richard. All righty. So, our last poet of the evening, Mr. Yash Dembinski. Okay. So, I'm going to start with uh, my beloved Rilke. And um, I think everybody here uh, will feel somewhat glorified um, in by Rilke um, at the same time uh, humbled. So without further ado, here's the poem. It's Sonnet 19 of the first part of Sonnets to Orpheus. Even though the world keeps changing quickly as cloud shapes, all things perfected fall home to the age old. Over the changing and passing, wider and freer, still lasts your leading song, God with the lyre. Not understood are the sufferings, neither has love been learned. And what removes us in death is yet unveiled. Only song over the land hallows and celebrates. Okay. <laughs> and I have a, um, 
I want to do, I have a short chapter of, uh, from Moses in Israel. Um, as for those of you that don't know, I've been uh, working on this very, very, very long poem, and uh, I take this opportunity to memorize a chapter. And as I do, I always find revisions I want to make. Um, I'm not going to uh, recite it, but uh, Bob, <laughs> I've, I couldn't resist. Could you read the part, the words of Pharaoh? I'll, right. read, I'll read everything else. You want me to sit here and come up? I'd, I'd prefer if you come up. I think you okay. could, you could, there's a certain point where I really hope you pull the full, bring the full Bob Glower. You don't want that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway. So, so you, you start off. Oh, okay. So just right here. Yeah, and then, and then. How would the, you like me to pronounce that? Uh, Hachaput? Yeah, that's, per, so, I mean, I don't know, but. Um, and then the yeah. end. <laughs> <laughs> And then you, you, you end there, and you can take your seat after that. Okay? You can take your seat after that. We're already on camera, and I, I don't think I'm going to ever live that one down. <laughs> Go right. ahead. So, so Hachaput's Hebrew son has returned. This should be interesting. Pharaoh drummed his fingers and smiled. Let him not be spurned. We will make him un informally welcome. He surely has useful information for us. Pharaoh signaled, and a servant brought coins for Korah. With hesitation, the elder declined the proffered payment. If I may forewarn you, your majesty, Korah spoke with trepidation, the man intends to inform you of what could be something most objectionable, a plan devised he says, by our God, the Lord. What? Pharaoh arched a painted eyebrow and leaned forward. And who will be the judge of that? Korah could make no reply. Thank you. Then he screened his eyes and bowed low. <laughs> Exit? Yes. <laughs> Then he screened his eyes and bowed low. He left the great house of the son of Ra, feeling uncertain what he had accomplished, and like a mouse eyed by two great and hungry cats in plain sight. Not the highly respected elder he knew himself to be. Damn God-obsessed men, he thought, thinking himself a builder of a bridge between two realms and unblessed by either. Through Israel's settlements, ignoring brief, friendly greetings, to where Moses dwelt, where were pitched his foreign tents, he walked, straight past guards he had posted there, and entered. He told Moses and Aaron that Pharaoh would receive them, but to be careful, very careful. With his eyes on the man, Moses sensed his thoughts slavery. He groaned inwardly to think their cousin had led the Israelites, the tribes, with the elders. His every word seemed a sin, laden with deception. Where was the faith of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob? The old priest, he who had spoken up, came to the tent. <clears throat> Moses, it is not my job to, to assist you. Actually, I thought I could call on you, Peter, to, to read these lines, but I don't know if you want to. It's just a few lines. You want me? I, I kind of would. It would be fitting, in my humble opinion. I think you would, you would bring a gravitas to them. The old priest, he who had spoken up, came to the tent. Moses. It is not my job to assist you, but I thought that the name and here these bones I bring of Joseph should be in your care when you speak words of our God to Pharaoh. Beneath a gem stitched hood he carried a box. Joseph's bones, the hour has come. Thank you. 
Cora's eyes lit with intense rage. How dare you move those without my consent? Ah, I'm going to let you. Uh, I have. I have the prerogative of my age and the knowledge in my heart. Be content, my son. The foreseen age has come. Thank you, sir. Uh, Before Cora could argue more, and don't take these words too seriously, (laughs) the priest collapsed. Moses laid him on his bed. Nothing more would he utter. Later, his soul's life fled. Okay. Uh, Now, just to make sure that we de-roll ourselves. <laughs> I, Peter, I, uh, I forgot that I had said that to you, but I'm glad somehow I'm, 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 I'm um, stepping up to the plate because I'm going to share my most recent poem oh, wow, as I well. <laughs> so. Courage to you. <laughs> Here we go. Reciprocated. Yes. <laughs> it's called uh, Watch a Nation Grow. Plant a poem in your head. Watch a nation grow. You are the center of all you see. A nation is a little thing, you know, with laws changing as quickly as cloud shapes, with brutal enforcement done sensibly, of course. Recite a poem and see it flow, the nation's self individually. Oh, I love, I love to love, to make apes of politician and Superman capes and say, I jest to you, but must I now? A nation is a slice of cheese on two crackers per the party's requirements, but the lips that eat it, the smile, She knew I'd yield. I submit with these blandishments. Okay, kind of bizarre. I know. I know. Rilke is is uh, between the lines. And the last poem is. um, uh, It really has been such a treasure for me. These gatherings, um, because they, they're like uh, you know. I just, they're just wonderful. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm, I want to recite, uh, I want to read a poem. I did recite it at his tribute to, uh, for David Good Tucker, who was a, a, a poet and a very original poet and a beautiful um, man who passed away. But after being with us for five or six, and we had the most tremendous um, tribute to him, and uh, I wrote this poem in his honor because I was driving along to my job as a, um, a prison inmate legal instructor, <laughs> if you can believe there's such a thing, only in Vermont. Uh, somehow I got the job. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and, uh, and this line came to me, and it was, it was this. Just came into my head. Life's heart gushes forth with streams of roses. And I thought to myself, heaven to Betsy, who could ever take such a sappy line? (laughs) And then somehow I thought, well, David Good Tucker could probably turn that, and by the end of the poem, you might even believe it. So here's the poem, and it's, uh, it's in tribute to David. Life's heart gushes forth with streams of roses, Poems that blossom with universal truths. Each one pulses from the joy of what is. Each may make radiant our wearied youths. With the petals aroma, the beauty. Come near, my friend, lover. Here, take this rose. Fulfill the purpose of its purity. Behold and smell 
Bring it close to your nose. Can you feel it, feel its tender, its touching grace? Do you fathom the wisdom of its eye, how it enhances your adoring face? One lovely flower and time rushes by into the whirling of this universe. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was, um, yeah, David Good Tucker was, was a beautiful soul. He came um, and he was part of her site. I had never met him before. And then we had this wonderful tribute and people who hadn't been here before and haven't been here since came and it was this wonderful celebration in poetry and song. It was just in, with tons of different voices yeah. speaking in tons of different ways about this man. It was really lovely. Thank you. That was, that was his spirit in that poem. That was very good. All righty. Um, thank you all for being here. Don't forget, Bookstock is at the end of this month. Don't forget to sign the book. <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. Yes, but that's true. Don't forget to sign the book here tonight. Um, Bookstock is at the end of this month, and the Thursday, the 25th, is the tribute to Mary Oliver in the evening at Artistry. And Bob and I are both um, going to be in the poetry part of that, and there's also dance and things. And I feel like there's something else I should say, but I don't know what it is. Um, so thank you, Macy, for doing this. Um, oh, and we now have our whole you know, um, high-tech room here. So if anyone has any visuals they would like to have be part of their poetry, we can do that now. So be in touch and we'll get it all set up and do it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for hosting. Thank yes. you.